finally, a source of raw, real, and honest information on healthcare issues that matter most. Welcome to BS Free MD. From the latest medical information to how to stay sane as a doctor or a patient, no subject is taboo, no BS is allowed. Now, let's welcome your hosts, Doctors May and Tim Heinmarsh. All right, everybody, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed last week's episode. And because we have gotten so many emails and questions and messages on social media, my plans for a financial uh, health based September have been foiled. We're here to serve the needs of what you want, and that means another COVID episode. The needs of the community come first! Last week, we talked about what was new up and coming with COVID, monoclonal antibodies, treatments, outpatient, etc., what's happening. But we've been getting so many questions about vaccines. Today's on the good, bad, and ugly. But before we dive in for the meat of the show, a little word from our sponsor this week, who is Deputy. Just a reminder that in healthcare, there are smart pieces of technology that businesses can't live without. And Deputy has become one of those essential platforms for more than 250,000 workplaces. It's helping medical practices schedule their staff more efficiently to meet peaks in patient demand. And it makes it easy to adjust schedules when the unexpected happens, like staff calling out sick. So you can use Deputy on any device on the go. Within a few minutes of picking it up, you'll see why it has hundreds of glowing reviews from managers and staff alike. To find out more and try Deputy for free, go to drpodcastnetwork.com slash deputy. I will link them again in the show notes. All right. Well, I'm going to keep Boss Boy here on track as he unloads and we answer your questions. Basically. As we drop Moab-sized truth bombs from 30,000 feet, bunker-busting bullshit. Yeah. Okay, so with uh, what's happening currently the week of September 13th, 2021, do we get vaxxed? Do we not get vaxxed? We're trying to keep politics out of this. So whatever side you may be leaning, um, let's just leave it Which at reminds that. me of that amazing Fruit of the Loom ad. Where they had, <laughs> I knew, where they, I was where waiting had, for you. Where they had the white, they had the blue... Shorts on the and on the clothesline, and then the red shorts, and and it, so it said blue. You know, it, it it said Democrat, and then it had red. Yes, and it said that's Republican, right. Yes, and then it had these striped ones, and it said you know undecided, and then and that's all it said, right? It, it, there was no talking, and then at the end, the guy just comes and he goes. Regardless of which way you're leaning this election season, we'll always give you our full support. And I'm love, like, who's the genius? That's the that's genius. So that, that, that guy should get a Nobel Prize for writing super good ads. So whichever way you're leaning this COVID season, we are bringing you our opinion based on information we know. And uh, basically, as I had this discussion yesterday with a good friend, it's very difficult when you're non-medical, but it's you dif- more it's difficult enough if you are. To sort out all the information. There's so much information. Who do you trust? How do you know? You hear it from both sides. Um, people I know and love and in healthcare will have a very opinionated thing, pro-vaccine. Uh, people I know and love in healthcare are very anti-vaccine. People I know and love have um, are in the middle. So how do you sort this out when you have no medical background? I don't know. I mean, honestly, I really do feel for you you really have to find who you trust and organizations that we think we should be trusting i won't name big organization names the cdc get very suspect when it looks like they are in bed with government pharma and other lifetime members who've been appointed to high positions that get the highest paid salary in the government yes but i deserve it because i am with the initial f anyway so we're trying to leave politics out of this, present what we know. And we will fail. And, you know, it's just two doctors living in rural Oregon doing real medicine, um, looking up all the info. And you know who our sources have been from previous shows. All right. So 
Vaccines, good, bad, and ugly, Tim. Let's get to the good. Let's let's present that side of things. Um, <laughs> you're just grinning. I, no, I think, go ahead. No, I think that it's. I think you have to be Helen Keller to not see that at least up until this point in North America, that the vaccines have been wildly successful at preventing hospitalizations and death. I mean, I think that's the case. Now, who who that is that it prevents it in, you know, is pretty much everyone that's vaccinated. I mean, there's always cases of the 40 year old that was previously healthy that's, you know, on, you know, intubated. And that's the stuff that all gets quoted. It gets blown out of proportion. If you look at actual numbers, this is still wildly a disease of unhealthy old people. The older you are and the less healthy you are, those are like massive multipliers. Um, if you look at your risk of hospitalization, I checked it this morning on the CDC. Um, as of today, you have an 1,800 in 100,000 person chance of being admitted with co- with a COVID-associated illness. You have to parse out every single syllable when you read this stuff from the CDC if you're, if you're over 60, okay? If you're a child, it's up to about 45-ish per 100,000. That's for hospitalization. Deaths are still super, super low. So, you know... So- we're saying that the vaccines do have some good and they do have some appropriateness, correct? Yes, no, absolutely. I mean, yes. you, you know, we, we, we debate with people online. We've, we've had, you know, been in, you know, these various online groups with, with who I, you know, guys I trust, obviously, like Peter McCullough and Harvey Rich and so forth. And, you know, there's every manner of everything, right? And if you look at the, if you look at the data right now in North America, I think clearly the vaccinated are doing far better than the unvaccinated. There, there's no there's no question of that. Does that mean everyone should run out and get vaccinated? Absolutely not. I mean, I don't I don't believe everyone should run out and get vaccinated. I think it depends on your risk. And this is why you need to talk to your personal physician, hopefully someone that reads studies and doesn't just read the CDC, because I think the CDC has been incredibly devious in some of the ways that it pulls out data. And we'll show you that, explain that to you today. Um, incredibly devious, but, uh, you know, are they, are they, but then you can't describe motive. Like it's easy to describe motive and say, you know, they're part of Bill Gates thing. They want to depopulate the world. You, you know, you can make that argument, but you have to show proof that that's the case. They may be trying to push people because they see other things that they're even more scared of. I mean, they may have righteous motivation. I don't know. I don't know the hearts of everybody, but I can tell you some of the th- the things they're using to rationalize you know, pushing vaccines to five-year-olds is patently, it, it's damn near insane from my perspective. Yeah. Um, what about, okay, let's let's just do a global view here. Uh, vaccine bad. Is vaccine bad? Yes, I think the vaccine is bad in children. And I mean, there's, a, there's an initial preprint um, and we're going to get into like why, how you can lie your ass off with statistics and look like a genius. But but the fact is, is that there's an, a preprint. And again, this is retroactive analysis looking at VAERS and VAERS is a veritable dumpster fire for trying to get information out of. It's tremendously difficult to get information out of. A lot of people think that there's one tenth of the actual vaccine side effects or uh, complications that are reported to VAERS. But these guys looked at it uh, and they found 254 kids with uh boys between the ages of what 12 and 15 had um cardiac adverse events like myocarditis just like a 370 and it was like a 370 to 610 percent difference in um being hospitalized 120 days after your second vaccination versus having a adverse cardiac event Okay, I mean, a lot of this stuff is loosey-goosey, which an adverse cardiac event. Okay, so you get myocarditis from the vaccine. Does that mean you're cardiac cripple or dead? For some kids, I guess, for sure. I mean, there's been kids killed by this vaccine. Um, So that's the thing that people have a hard time discerning. You know, we're throwing this back and forth here. But the, you know, people will argue that, well, if you get COVID and you're not vaccinated, then you can have these untoward effects from the viral illness and have myocarditis. And then there's the other side that says, well, if you get the vaccine and you're inducing, putting something in your body and taking on that risk of getting an adverse 
reaction, then you're putting yourself at risk from getting a vaccine reaction. And how do you compare what's the higher risk and the okay. odds game? And uh, that's that's what people, I think, get where they get stuck. Because uh, it's like, uh, right. I could get sick from getting COVID and have myocarditis, or do I get the vaccine and take the chance of getting okay. it? And so how do you know what's worse? Let me explain why I think the risk-benefit ratio in kids is completely tilted towards not getting vaccinated. Kids don't get COVID at a very high rate. They don't get really sick at a very high rate, and they don't die at a very high rate. There's still only been 412 children since the onset of this pandemic that have died in the United States with, quote, COVID-associated illness. Say that again for the people in the back. There have only been 412 children as of September 8th since the beginning of the pandemic in the United States, in the United States. that have died of COVID-associated illness. What the hell is a COVID-associated illness? Honestly, m- uh, th- apparently... COVID-associated right. illness. So they Not had, even from COVID. It's so COVID-associated they, So they had illness. COVID. They could have had end-stage lymphoma, got COVID. The COVID tipped them over the edge. They were going to die anyways. They could have had... And the vast majority of these children are have super significant comorbid conditions. Okay, you know, whether they have congenital heart disease, whether they have cerebral palsy, et cetera, et cetera, you know, childhood leukemias, et cetera, et cetera. That is an infinitesimally small number of children. Okay, okay? now what about, think back to polio. If you weren't dying from polio, you still had long-term complications from the illness. Is COVID doing that to people, to kids? COVID is doing that, but the long COVID syndrome is exceedingly, un- it, it, it's real and it's, because so many people have had COVID, the absolute number of people that have had long COVID is high, but the percentages is very low. Okay. Got to remember this. Here's the problem. And let's, the other thing that before you take off on that, I get, I think we talked about this before, but I get so frosted about long COVID. I mean, the definitions and who's defining long COVID are what you would define for what you get after you've had a, like pneumonia yeah it's like it's too- fatigue right for decreased what- appetite no energy uh, like trouble concentrating that's all part of it so in the questionnaire they define any of those symptoms as part of long covid not just right, not it- hypoxia with activity or muscle weakness or myocarditis if you're a kid and you have fatigue for four weeks like you get when you have mono hello, I had it for eight months, I guess I had long mono, then they're lumping that all together. That was my, wasn't that my pet, you, the pet name you gave me in? <laughs> long mono? <laughs> mono it's mono. not that funny. Anyway, so, so here's the problem, okay? Here's the problem. This is why vaccines have to be exceedingly, exceedingly safe. And you'll, you'll see the CDC, they, they almost, they just say safe and effective, safe and effective. They do not say, What's the app? It's absolute numbers that matter. Okay. How many people are damaged? Okay. We've had, by very conservative estimates, 13,000 people die of vaccine complications from the COVID vaccine. That is bazillions of miles further than other vaccine damage. Other vaccines were, what, what did they pull the, the H1N1 vaccine for like 40 deaths or something like that? Oh, it was super low. It was super low because this was before all of this was like just politics. Okay, so here here's the deal. Kids don't get COVID very easily. The reason they don't is unknown, but the theory that Paul Alexander put forward when we interviewed him, that they lack the receptor in their nose to receive the virus into their body makes perfect sense. Okay, so kids don't get it very – because of that, they, they, they lack the – they lack the uh, receptor. They don't get it very easily. Therefore, they don't transmit it very easily. And therefore, they don't get you know, violently ill as often. Okay. Now, here's the deal. To, to vaccinate all, your, all the many little children of the world, you're giving 100% of the vaccinated children spike protein in their blood. The spike protein is an evil bastard that causes the lung problems, the breathing problems, the co- the clotting problems. There's a lot of people that think that even the respiratory problems in COVID are primarily micro clotting. So you're giving them the spike protein in their blood 100% of the time. So even if the vaccine in children, okay, was decreased their chances of, uh, no, even if the vaccine in children 
decreases their chances of getting COVID by a hundred times. You're vaccinating 100% of them with spike protein in their blood. So, so you're giving every child the risk of a vaccine, vaccine side effect when most kids that are, that are exposed to COVID are, are going to not get it or they're going to get a super mild case because they don't have the molecular architecture in their body to get it severely, especially healthy kids. So, so you have to, like the vaccine has to be so profoundly safe to overcome that, that, um, th- that inherent risk involved with getting spike protein in your blood, okay? Now, if you're 85 years old, you need as much immunity as you can. Your immune system has taken a dump. You got a million ACE2 receptors all over your body. So your ability to get COVID, get a giant viral load and get infected is way higher. So there, the risk of the vaccine is exponentially decreased and the benefit of the vaccine is exponentially increased. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Be- because mm-hmm. you don't want all these kids running around with, with, with immunity just in their blood. Okay, because the absolute risk of native COVID is still super duper low and the risk of death to a normal child, I would argue when you look at those numbers of 412 total is basically zero. Like you'll hear about the 35 year old marathon runner that died of COVID. You don't hear about the five year old that went to daycare who was totally healthy running around and playing dinosaur and then got covid and died and had nothing else you know no type 1 diabetic etc i mean it's like these pictures we see people have the balls to post these pictures online here's my here's my 14 year old daughter on a on you know on high flow oxygen she's perfectly healthy and i'm like she's in a bariatric hospital bed you got a 15 year old that's 300 pounds. What part of that's what part of looking like a manatee is perfectly healthy? No, I know it's it's not pers- perfectly healthy. It's personal perception. Well, you can be too. fat and healthy. No, no, yeah, you can. You can be chubby and healthy. You can't be 300 pounds at 15 and be healthy. I'm sorry, that's impossible. Yeah. Am I fat shaming? I don't care. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's under risk factors. Good. Um. You got me. You got you got me. I'm thinking of manatees now. Thanks a lot. I'm just Barbara so manatee. Well, okay. So we, I don't think we're, we're not getting any questions about are they injecting us with like luminofluorescence tracker jack? Uh, tr- I can't even remember the term from Hunger Games. Are they tracking us? All that kind of business. I mean, I think it's the really trying to decide risk versus benefit. Um, risk of injecting us with some substance that we don't know the long-term consequences of, especially if you have some life to live. And so I think that's the big thing, especially the younger uh, ages in kids, in infants, pregnant people. Like That's what people are, I mean, they're using their brain and they're saying, everyone keeps saying it's safe and effective, but we don't have any long-term data. So you can't pull the wool over people's eyes and say it's safe and effective because... Um, it's been out for mm, a year. We have no long-term data. So, yeah, if you're 85 and you have one year to live, go ahead and get the vaccine because are you going to worry about the 20-year ramifications? No. If you're a child and you have your whole life ahead of you and this spike protein causes, you know, blood disorders, dyscrasias, leukemia, clotting problems for the rest of your life? Is that a risk you're willing to put on that unknown? Like, we don't know. It might be perfectly safe, but it might not. I mean, and well, that's but, what but, people but, are but asking, and it's a the, valid question. And it, what's but, but frustrating you know, is that the uh, medical medical people and people in higher up and in government, they are ignoring that, and they're shaming people for thinking that. But, but you don't have to even – you can eliminate the long-term data. Eliminate it, and especially in kids, it's obviously not perfectly safe. Like, I don't think there's any way you can calculate anything, especially when you look at the studies that they used, where they had like 3,500 kids in the study, and the, and the study said the, in, the, in the treatment arm, they had zero cases of COVID, zero. Okay, so they're literally making, they're literally making a decision on the vaccine 
with zero cases. Right. Zero cases. Like, no, no, you have to have breakthrough cases. You have to wait for people to get it that were vaccinated. Otherwise, otherwise you have it, it, it completely ties your your hands behind your back with a huge safety issue, which is what happens when people have a breakthrough infection. Well, they had zero cases in the pediatric side. Like like it is such shoddy science. And then and then Pfizer and Moderna, br- the, most people don't know this. They broke the code. They got rid of the placebo group as of about four months ago. There's no placebo group. There's nobody in their placebo group from the 47,000 people in the total study from Pfizer and Moderna, about the same size studies. There's no more placebo group. They offered them all the vaccine and like 80 or 90 percent of them took the vaccine. So, so there, this, study, it, this study is on you. The right. study is on, on the, the, the general public. That's the study. Yes. Exactly. Okay. You, you are the experiment now because they, 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 they essentially dispensed with that study. It's done. It's gone. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, so this ongoing studies. Yeah. Well, the ongoing studies, you doesn't mean it good. Doesn't make it bad. But that's the way it is right now. So uh, I'm trying to keep this apolitical, but what about the um, mandating vaccines through health, not just healthcare workers, but uh, I guess anybody with over 100 employees now, isn't that what what uh, President Biden wants to do? Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously. No, I don't. I we mean, have no control over like, that I, I just think it's unconstitutional. It's going to be sorted out in the courts. Unfortunately, for people that are in real time, if you're faced with, I'm going to have to get the vaccine or get fired, you're going to have to figure out if, what the risk-benefit ratio is for you. Like, honestly, for most people, if you're over 18 years old, the risk is, is not high. It really isn't. Like, like we, we are amplifying the risks of the vaccine because we have no long-term data and because it causes way more vaccine side effects and really bad effects than we've seen with other vaccinations. So comparing this vaccine to other vaccines, it's way, 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 way more dangerous. But that's still really, really, really safe. And that's the thing that people need to understand. But I see morons on Facebook comparing this to smallpox. Right. I mean, Really? really <laughs> that that's like con, that's like comparing consensual cons, consensual sex to rape yes they're both sex but they're very different yeah i know um what let's go down the um channel of um the myths truths of people okay right now what's happening is it's mostly the unvaccinated that are getting sick Ending up in ICUs, flooding the system. We're seeing a crisis across the U.S. I just came back from Canada. It's the same way up there. And now it's becoming a hate fest on people who are unvaccinated. It's the unvaxxed versus vax because now the unvaxxed are the ones getting ill, plugging up the system, overworking the healthcare workers, stressing up the system. There's, you know, going to be no room for your your neighbor who has an MVA and is in a car accident in the ICU because it's plugged up with unvaccinated people dying of COVID. What do you think? Well, I I think right now that's the case. I mean, if you look to Israel and the UK, that's not the case where they have like rapidly ramping up uh, vaccinated people being admitted now. And again, now I, I mean, it gets tough, right? Because uh, well, going down too personal of a route, you know, we have, people in healthcare dealing with this people get frustrated they're ticked off they're mad it's like yeah but it's it's social responsibility right. that you're not doing your part um yeah but but, 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 but what's your freaking part like here's the part i don't understand like you understand the devil is truly in the details and and, and when they report this stuff there is a there it is it's steaming with so much bullshit like honest to god you think that you were in in the neighbor's yard with the cows because because they say un, they, they take two words and they replace them. If you read the CDC data, it is or you read data that's put out by hospitals where they have all the little stick figures. And here's the number of people in the ICU that are vaccinated and the ones that aren't. OK, it's it's not fully vaccinated. That's the secret code word. OK. And and so what you're seeing in hospitals as far as the vaccine and what you're seeing in reality are two different things. We have 
we have a staggeringly high percentage of Americans with at least one dose of mm-hmm. the vaccine. Right. Okay. It's almost 70. It's like 72 and a half percent. Okay. If that person with one dose who way back when we started was supposed to have 75 or 80 percent of the effectiveness instead of the 90 to 95 percent of the effectiveness. Okay. That person gets sick, gets ventilated. He goes in the unvaccinated bin. Okay. My friend, who damn near died of this, got vaccinated, got COVID within two weeks. Oh, he didn't wait his two-week waiting period. He goes in the unvaccinated bin, not the vaccinated bin. Every person with any one billionth of a shred of common sense would go, well, you know, uh, Billy got vaccinated, and then he got the COVID, and he's, like, really, really sick. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. You're not fully vaccinated unless you wait two weeks. Really? Because you know what? That's a really, really, really important piece of data. What if you get COVID within that two weeks? And what if that's a wildly disproportionate number of sick people? That means your vaccine is making people more sick. Do they do they quote that data? Not a shred. No. They go in the unvaccinated bin. So honest to God, vaccinated versus unvaccinated in the hospital, I don't know what it means. Well, and now uh, talk a little bit about what's going on in, isn't it England, where they are actually finding that they're, is it England where they're having more vaccinated yeah, it's it's emerging because the people thing, in like the, hospital like now. The, 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 we talked about this last in week. ICU with COVID. Like, like the massive, the massive potential tsunami is if this causes ADE. And if this causes anti- antibody dependent edema or uh, enhancement. enhancement, we are screwed, like royally screwed. And and the only people that are going to have the super mega immunity are going to be people that maybe people that get boosters every four months, which could potentially even make the ADE worse because we don't know because it hasn't been studied. Um. The only people with a hope are going to be the natural immunity people and potentially people on on reasonable prophylactic medication if the ivermectin data in prophylaxis turns out to be as good as it looks in epidemiological studies, not randomized controlled trials. So that's I mean, that's a whole other set of data points that I don't want to get too bunny trailed on. So, um, yeah, it's I don't know. I the other thing, you know not to be political but the to get to the whole point of firing healthcare workers or healthcare workers quitting because um they're put on admin permanent administrative unpaid leave because they're not vaccinated makes no sense to me when i mean when you talk this through to anybody if you're a healthcare worker and you come to work and you're asymptomatic you're not sick like who goes to work sick anyway but especially in a pandemic and they're screening you have on full PPE. Most of the time you're wearing an N95 mask as well as the shower curtain, I mean, gowns, masks, uh, goggles, gloves, hand washing, precautions. And you're caring for people who are in the hospital who are sick with COVID. The risk is not for the unvaccinated healthcare worker to be infecting people in the hospital. It's the other way around. It's like, they're taking that on themselves and putting themselves at risk. That's their choice. So I don't understand the firing and laying off of people well, during a pandemic when we already have a shortage, when that's a risk they're willing to take. We don't, like, gosh, we had the vascular surgeon who was a smoker. Did we, like, fire him because he's a smoker and no, he's operating cause, cause on No, because he was a really, really good vascular cancer. surgeon. That's, that was his risk. I mean... But he was awesome because he, he would open someone's chest and take out a giant lung cancer and then he'd walk into the doctor's lounge, light a smoke, get a cup of coffee and turn to his resident and say, I know how I'm going to die. So this whole thing of what? So they're in the hospital and these unvaccinated people are somehow going to be spread. That's just BS. You're not going to be spreading it to other people in the hospital. No, no, because the vaccinated people I'm convinced of are the ones that are spreading this. So that's the other thing. There is data that shows that vaccinated people now are the ones who are like, well, I'm vaccinated. I'm living my life. I don't need to wear my mask. I don't need to wash my hands. I'm good. I'm protected. They're a little more careless. They can be silent carriers of the virus because, you know, their body's fire- oh, I don't fighting think I, I still don't. I still don't buy asymptomatic spread. I think it's very unlikely. It's probably much more likely with 
with the Delta variant. But what I think what happens is this, because I had COVID and I was vaccinated and I know what it was like. Well, look, at and I'll tell you exactly but, but, what but it's like. you know, before you get super sick, you're you're having asymptomatic I, spread because you're because you're like mildly symptomatic. Oh, it's allergies. My eyes are burning. You're walking around. Exactly. I would not virus. Have, I would have not have been tested. I had a, I had a sore throat for four hours. I had ridden a motorcycle for eight hours the day before and six so, hours that day. Yeah, so, yes. I got home. I was tired as hell. You know, it was 105 degrees two days prior. You know, I'd been partying for the week previous, blah, blah, okay. blah. Symptomatic spread that is kind of ignored and written off as something Correct. else. Because the viral loads in people that are vaccinated that have a breakthrough infection and the viral loads in people that are unvaccinated are the same. So I think there's tons of minimally symptomatic vaccinated right. people spreading this like crazy. I think that that's probably more likely just on average as far as spread than uh, the, than the 25 percent or 26 percent of people that have never had a single shot being the big spreaders. I think that that is I think I, I think that, that that just doesn't statistically make sense to me. OK, especially knowing the viral loads in the vaccinated and unvaccinated. Now, having said that, you have minimally symptoma symptomatic vaccinated people with crap tons of viral load in their nose. And then they spread that to unvaccinated people. And then the unvaccinated people disproportionately are screwed. There's no qu like right now, unless something changes as time goes by, which England and Israel are sort of giving us some information on that. Right now in the United States, that's the case. And that's the case we're being vaccinated as a relatively healthy 50 or 55 year old is do you want the protection right now going forward, knowing that Delta could potentially burn out versus the risk of, you know, getting it and getting really sick and just being unlikely, unluck, unlucky. And for most people, I mean, if you have any hint of a coexisting condition and you're over 50, I would say, yeah, you're, it's probably it's probably in your best interest to get vaccinated at that stage of the game. I think people that shouldn't get well, vaccinated. Well, we, we'll get to that. But let's squish another myth about the whole thing of the variant is blamed on the unvaccinated people. No, oh, my. That guy, that guy I, the... we, I posted uh, on our Facebook page a really good interview with a virologist from McMaster. I think he's, I can't remember, in Canada, who explains it very simply um, that anyone can understand how variants occur. It's not... It's not the unvaccinated people. Well, no variants. They should watch it. No, evolutionarily, you're, you're t like, like the, the virus wants to live, and therefore any roadblocks you put up in front of it, such as a vaccine, piss it off, and it's like it gets tougher and stronger. It goes to the gym. It works out. It morphs. It strengthens itself so that it can bust through. So when you come up with treatment plans and you come up with vaccines, then it's like, hmm, I'll find a way. Just. I mean, most people know and hear about um, uh, MRSA, right? How did that happen? It's because because you, the bacteria got smart. Uh, same with antibiotic well, resistance. Well, no, but MRSA is antibiotic resistant. It's largely antibiotic resistance right. because people would bathe themselves in <laughs> antibiotic soap, which is the most idiotic thing you can come up with. So for, for the um, variants in viruses, it's usually pushed because of treatment plants to block the virus and then it wants to adapt and survive well right of and course so like, the, evolutionarily thing of the, it's unvaccinated e people e evolutionarily no. putting a roadblock up to a virus is going to mean that it's going to make more variants yeah so i get tired like, looking and on and facebook like, and everybody that's like read something on twitter or whatever just reposts that unvaccinated people are causing variants it's totally wrong it's totally wrong like, like that's just that's just that's lying. It's anyway, like it's like I'd... Fauci coming out two days ago and he goes, there's absolutely no evidence that ivermectin does anything. Absolutely no evidence, no epidemiological evidence, no nothing. He can come out and say that he doesn't like the evidence, that he doesn't think it's robust enough. He can make all sorts of really cogent act. But when you go, there's absolutely no evidence. There is a medical term for that. It's called lying sack of shit. Yeah. Well, and we have to be careful what we say because now we're being monitored by the uh, various boards in the U.S. You know what? And, you know what? God, uh, if we I... don't tow the party line, they could pull our license. So, so pull my freaking license. We might be podcasting and not <laughs> doctoring, but anyway. 
here we are sharing the truth. Uh, like at this point, from I'm our so, point of view, um, you know, honestly, though, if we can't have this kind of discussion, we're not anti-vaccine. It, we no. are. We are pro-thought. Yes. If we can't have. I was thinking about this. If the American Board of Family Practice comes after and says we want to take your board certification away, so you can't just practice. You can't just not practice medicine where you live in your state. You can't do it anywhere in the United States. Then you know what? If this isn't the kind of discussion, the robust discussion, the honest. We don't know. We're asking questions. I'm not coming out as an authority like some people and saying the vaccine's the death shot. No, I think the vaccine is a bullet in the chamber. I don't think it's the only bullet in the chamber. If they want to take away my freaking board certification for this, then their board certification isn't worth a shit. <laughs> okay, tell me how you really feel. How do you really? Uh, right. So uh, we got to jump into what's happening in social media with Nicki Minaj. Um, oh, please, no. Come on, everybody wants to know it, including our children. Um, so what she tweeted, I don't do Twitter, but I guess she tweeted about her, her, you know, her opinion is that you have to be careful. Uh, and she said that a family member, I can't remember who it was, nor does it matter, had the vaccine, um, and then developed suddenly afterwards, I think it was in two weeks, uh, inflammation of the testicles, we call it orchitis, and is now impotent. Uh, of course, everybody refuted, not everybody, but people are on our case and experts saying it's coincidence. It could be. But we do know that viral infections can cause that. Mumps is the classic one. Uh, but um, who knows if these vaccines are pro-inflammatory what could have happened well they're for sure pro pro-inflammatory that's the no whole that's point. what i mean I, that's what i'm saying since the vaccine's pro-inflammatory um it's not a commonly reported thing on VARES, but who knows so what ticks me off and i'm not a Mick, Nicki minaj fan by any means is that she she's saying how she's going to do her research and and make a decision for herself, which is what everybody should do. You can't beat somebody up for that. Everybody's situation is different. Uh, they're celebrities. They're people, too. They have health problems. Leave M Nicki Minaj alone to make her own informed decision with her physician, which we want everybody to do. So I think it's interesting how everybody's a bandwagoner. Anyway, there we mentioned it. We'll make some people happy. Let's sort of summarize vaccines. And I'll throw out some scenarios, but who should get them? Who should not get them? Okay. Uh, old sick people should get them. I think over 60, especially if you have... Defined old. Real, Honestly, I mean, the older you get, the worse it is. We talked about this in our previous podcast. It's really over 60, yeah. over 60, over 65. That's kind of, you know, medical oldness. Um, There's a gray zone from like 40 to 60 depending on your health situ right. situation. I mean, look, if you had a BMI of 40 and you're 40 years old, would I get the vaccine? Yeah, I'd get the vaccine. Right. Because you're, I mean, when you look at morbidly obese people, th their risk is way, way higher. So yeah, I would do that. And then you, you stack. So now define sick and comorbidities. So if you're 40 to 60, you have hypertension, you're overweight. Well, and then they, they all kind of multiply, right? Right. So, you know, so the the number one thing they, they noticed, at least way back when, when we first started looking at this in hospital admissions, is people that got the sickest had the highest blood sugars on admission, regardless of whether they had previously di diagnosed diabetes or not. It didn't matter. It, and so so there's probably, a, you know, there's this whole cohort of pre-diabetics. They get sick. Their blood sugar goes to, to crap. So, you know, diabetics, um, you know, obese people. Obese, like be honest, people. Well, to get monoclonal antibody, all B you got all you got to have is is a BMI no of, of over twenty five, which is not even close to obese. Like most people, I mean, the BMI is total BS. But if you have a BMI of thirty five, it's not because you're Joe Rogan and you're really fit. It's because you're fat. Okay. Yeah. If you have a BMI of forty, twenty five to killing thirty you. is in the you're kind of chunky zone. <clears throat> obese. Obese starts at thirty. Starts at thirty, but it's, right? It, it, if you're really, really strong, it's pretty easy to get into the obese range and not have ex. Like the definition of obesity is excess body fat, right? So you can have a BMI of thirty and not have excess body fat, which is, you know, but but it's significant, and people 
underplay, you know, I'm really under, st- underplay I'm, that part. I'm heavy and I'm really strong, but you know what? I have to take out belt loops now, and that wasn't from working out. <laughs> so, I mean, you got to be honest with yourself. Exactly. So those core, uh, comorbid conditions, autoimmune things. Um, Lung disorders. Yes, asthma's, respiratory. As, asthma's really on the fence. I it's know. It's interesting. They don't push asthmatics. It's, it, it's interesting. They don't seem, but, you know. If I had bad lung disease, would I be, you know... You I would know, add that to the list of, you know, pros and cons when I'm thinking about this decision with my physician, healthcare provider. Um, who should probably not or vi- think solidly about not getting the vaccine? I would not. I would absolutely not. Vac- I would... Look, the hill I'll die on is kids. That's number one. Um, so those under 18, over 18, I think it's it's different. I under 18, you know, the 12 to 17-year-olds, uh, there might be some tiny slivers where it makes sense. Kids with really, really bad, you know, congenital heart disease or cystic fibrosis or Kids something Kids who are like very that. fragile have a condition yeah. that so would land them in the ICU that, but like if just anything tipped them over the edge. Mass vaccination of children and mass vaccination of, like, college students, I think, is completely – you can't make I, – I cannot see the argument that the, the benefit – outweighs the risk. The other one is if you're COVID recovered and I don't want, I, I'm sick of hearing the people, I got really sick in December of 2019 and I know it was COVID. No, you don't know shit. Excuse my French. You don't know what you had because I was really, really sick like December 3rd of 2016 and like whatever. If you had documented, tested positive COVID, you had COVID symptoms you, you know, you had a cough, a fever, lost taste and smell. If you had COVID, yes. And you recovered, I would not get vaccinated. No. Period. End T- of story. T-cell immunity is showing significant lasting. L- l- let's take that bunny trail for a second. There's a reason intuitively, without even doing a study, why native immunity is going to be better. We know SARS viruses cause B and T-cell immunity when we look back for like 17, 18 years ago when people had the first SARS pandemic, okay? They have memory cells that are still active. Now, these are smaller studies. They're retrospective. We haven't reinfected them with the virus to see what happens because, of course, that you know you can't do that unless you're in Nazi Germany. So, but, but it suggests that they have very durable long-term memory immunity, okay? Number one. Number two, when you get the vaccine, you're getting spike protein immunity only end of story the virus is made up of two main proteins the spike protein which is the little hooky hook that gets into your body little velcro and the capsid protein which is the little space capsule which houses the rna that the virus then injects into your cells to replicate itself okay so when you get native immunity you get spike protein immunity and capsid immunity there are laboratory studies suggesting that that makes a wildly different amount of immunity if you have both thirdly you get mucosal immunity respiratory viruses enter your body through your nose unless you are a knuckle dragging mouth breather virtually everything bad that comes into your respiratory system comes through your nose so you develop immune cells on your little nose hairs and nose snots that eliminate the virus before it can get into your system. You don't get that with this vaccine because you don't snort the vaccine. You get it injected into you. So just intuitively, native immunity should be better. What is the argument that native immunity wouldn't be as good? Because people get a varying amount of it. Some people got really sick and had super high viral loads. Some people barely got a viral load and tested trip to test positive so it, it's very it's confusing if and so i would call a covid rec- this is my definition no one else's of a covid recovered person is you had to get sick you had to have symptoms it wasn't that you played in the nba and tested positive i don't think that means jack you you got the sniffles you got a cold you got super sick you got whatever but you had some symptoms and a positive and test, a positive test and you got better that's covid recovered yes and if you do not know, I'm going to put a link to a place where you can find out if you have T-cell immunity. It's a T-detect test that you can order. I think it's $150 to get the test. Then you actually have to have a telehealth visit with someone to approve 
it, then you need a lab to draw the blood, which uh, gets pretty expensive, but anywhere from 60 to $90. But you can find out, will an employer or uh, Grand Puba Biden uh, acknowledge that? I don't know. But well, it depends, which is also in his pants. Depends. Anyway, so <laughs> anyway, um, women of childbearing age, should they get the vaccine? I, I That's where you want long term data. I mean, there was people advocating to vaccinate women of childbearing, w- pregnant women when the vaccine should didn't pregnant, even exist should as pregnant long as a women pregnancy. Get, should pregnant women get the vaccine? No, because you don't know. I mean, that's that's what you I'm need long term really data. getting tired of gynecologists, uh, OBs. Saying that it's safe, how? No, no, you do. And the when double you go H2 the, you picks, go, do you know that it's safe? You go I just the, go back to thalidomide. I mean, it just th- this is what off. you do if you are a pregnant woman that doesn't want to get vaccinated because you want long-term data. Go in and say, you are recommending a vaccine to me. Please tell me how many people were in. The most approved vaccine we have is Pfizer. So let's assume we're going to use that one. Tell me how many people total were in each group. The total group the placebo group, and the treatment group. Tell me that. How many people in the placebo group got COVID versus how many people in in the treatment group? If they don't know that answer, tell them that they don't know squat because they should not be recommending that unless they know that because this is a brand new treatment. This isn't isn't diphtheria where you can look back on, like, what is it, 100 years of vaccination, and you don't need to know the study data. This, you need to know the study data. And guess what, kids? There was 23,000 people in the treatment group, and eight of them got COVID versus 173. So that is not robust data. And say, and, and then say, the coup de gras. How many pregnant women were included in that study? Mm-hmm. And the answer is the easiest answer in the world. Zero. So it was pr- approved with an EUA with zero pregnant women because that would never happen in the initial vaccine trial. And then they moved on to just starting kind of an observational trial where they just kind of vaccinated the whole world and we'll see what happens. So, no, that's how I would combat that. Right. That 43,000, about 22,000 in each group, eight in the treatment in the treatment group. 173 or so in the in the in the placebo group that's how they got the numbers and and it like the incidence of the disease was so low the treatment group was less than one percent so, so you can only prevent the disease by one percent based on that data yeah but, so, but so basically no insane. good info um what about someone who's had a previous reaction to vaccine such as guillain barre with the flu vaccine Absolutely freaking lutely not exactly and, and like, and they should be able to get a medical exemption. If you can't, if your doctor won't yeah, but do it, does, it, but it doesn't matter. You're still going to lose your job. You're going to get a medical exemption, and and the and the law states that they have to provide reasonable accommodation. Well, the reasonable accommodation that United Airlines and a lot of these giant health centers are doing is they're they're laying you. They're not firing you. They're laying you off without pay. I know it's sad, and that's it's, the reasonable accommodation. This is the times we're living in. Like it's it, it, it and it's crazy. I, I want to get onto one more thing because I think it's really important. Um, which is which is how statistics can lie, like you can't even believe. Okay, so this is right from I am I am literally reading this from the CDC website. Okay, and it said, uh, COVID associated hospitalizations have risen risen rapidly for children and adolescents younger than eighteen years old. Weekly rates. Okay, weekly not. Absolute rates, weekly rates of COVID-19 associated hospitalizations per 100,000 children ages 5 to 11 years have tripled over a recent eight-week period. Ooh, tripled. From 0.3 per 100,000 children during the week of ending June 26th, 2021, to 0.9 per 100,000 children during the week ending not even one August child. August 21. 20, Not even one child okay. in 100,000. So why is this such so crazy? Because they're taking two different weeks and they're comparing them. So you can take any two weeks and compare them and basically make it say what you want. I What I call this is, this is called studying Amish uh, STDs. So you can say in the week of 
J- June 22nd, 2020 to the week of, compared to the week of August 22nd, 2021, there was a 3,000% increase in Amish, Amish STDs. And you're like, wow, that's a lot. Well, right. Because if you had one case of an STD in an Amish community, and now you had 300, you have a 3,000% increase. It's still only three 300 people in all of Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. That's still a lot of people. What's going on? No, I know. I know. They they went on their rumskaga and they got a little bit out of control. You know, first it's the cell phone and before you know it, you're in the bed of a woman of ill repute. And you know, he come back. He's 19 years old. His his mother do the washing. And she see, I see some stain in, in some very sinful places oh, on his okay, clothes. Stop. So we get him to test and before you know it, He's screaming and yelling when he's passing his waters because it's like the flames of hell coming out of his pee hole. They're laughing, but that's a significant change, and you have to question why. So what's going on? Are they all changing their lifestyle? They're going on a bender. Did one hooker permeate the Amish community? But there is. But there is. And again, I'm making these numbers up. No, I know. I'm making these numbers up. And and they're in, it's totally superlative to make the point because there is a thing called rumspringa where Amish youth after high school will go off and, 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 and you know, sow their wild oats. So, yes, you could absolutely have a 3,000% increase. You could have a 3,000% increase every year when you compare two different weeks based on if it's the time they come back from sowing their wild oats and maybe they were promiscuous with people that were infected. Yes. So that's the point. Mm -hmm. It's absolute numbers that you have to, you know, even in this stuff where we talked about how how much a higher risk for an adverse cardiac event in 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 these young boys was, it was still only 254 cases. So it could be amazing data, but I tend to be on the safety side. Anything that pushes, you know, vaccine risk at all makes me super reticent, especially in a population that has such an absolute low risk for severe COVID. That's the thing. If COVID killed kids at three times the rate of 85 year olds, then absolutely I would be out there with a drum beating it. Vaccinate your kids. Right. Because because then the cost benefit ratio is wildly in favor of vaccination. That's what this is. Ultimately, you have to make your own decision with your own information and your own physician on what makes sense from a risk benefit ratio for you. And unfortunately, part of the risk is losing your job. And so to those people, I mean, our son is young and he got vaccinated because he knew the military was going to make him get vaccinated. He goes, I'll just take care of it now before they make me and before I have to stand in line. And I mean, it's his decision. He's an adult. He can do that. And I mean, I didn't say, oh, you're getting the death shot or the mark of the beast. I said, well, you know, get this vaccine and not that one. So, I mean, that's the kind that's the kind of decision you have to make. I can't. People are like, should I get this? And it's like, I don't know. It's like somebody just randomly coming up to you at the store and saying, should I get married? And I'm like, well, it kind of depends. Exactly. Exactly. So there you have it. That's our take on vaccines. We hope that has been helpful and answered some questions and cleared some air. And if you're more confused than ever. So are we. <laughs> We're sorry. There's the Canadian in me. All right. Reminder. Thanks to our sponsor today for letting us be here. Uh, and if you want to boost efficiency across your practice, and if you have a medical practice and make staff scheduling easier, try the Deputy app. You can try this smart technology for free by going to drpodcastnetwork.com slash deputy. That's drpodcastnetwork.com slash deputy. We are actively seeking sponsors soon. Um, we will take any, kind, well, not any, we will take no, we will not take any kind of sponsor. I, I backed Let, up. I, I, we will take yeah. any kind of donation as a sponsor. Uh, talk to me. Send me an email. We'll work something out. But we would love to promote some local businesses, healthy businesses. If you have a gym, if you have a great product, um, if you have something that uh, like massage therapy or, I don't know, something fun, we'd like to feature you. And... Um, share get the word out uh, so share this podcast with somebody you know love or hate 
Um, we hope it's been helpful. And keep your emails coming. We prefer you reach us at doc at bs3md.com for any questions. Have a good one. Stay healthy. Make informed choices. Peace and out. It's no secret that medicine is a bit um, uptight. That's why Tim and I created BS Free MD to mix things up a little and have fun in the process. Besides, we are having these exact same discussions all the time, so we thought we might as well invite everyone to the party. If you really like us, you can get plenty more and maybe see one of Tim's cool tattoos on our Instagram or Facebook pages at BS Free MD. See you next time. But we try to keep BS Free MD as raw and real as possible. We can't be held responsible for any medical decisions or discussions had as a result of what you've heard on the show. We know, bummer. But the truth is, we really do care about your questions. So feel free to reach out to us by email at doc at bsfreemd.com. We could write a song about that. It's an Amish STD. I got it in the back of my buggy. She put the dress up above the, the knee. knee. And now it hurts really bad when to I'm pee. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, it's good. We just pulled that right out of our ears. No mm-hmm. one would know. I mean, just like the, songwriting, the songwriting is absolutely unbelievably amazing. It really is. I mean, it's, it's Simon and Garfunkel. Who's who? There she's I think waiting. It's sunny, down. it's sunny and share. Yeah. I got you, babe. That's right. All right. I got clap, babe. Ha ha ha!